Hello and thanks for listening. Welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and help us out on Patreon if you can. There is a link in the description. Designing a dependable turbopump is one of the hardest problems for rocket scientists. The rest of a rocket engine almost seems simple in comparison. The blades of your turbines and impellers must spin at tens of thousands of times per second. NASA recently built a 3D printed hydrogen powered turbopump. Here it is. You know I prefer metric, but this is an imperial, so I'll convert as we go. This pump was able to move 1,200 gallons of liquid hydrogen per minute, or 76 liters per second. Since hydrogen has a density of about 71 grams per liter, this would be a mass fuel flow of 5.4 kilograms per second. It generates 2,000 horsepower or 1,491 kilowatts of power. This is a small turbo pump, made for a second stage engine, but it's producing twice as much horsepower as a race car engine does and allows the rocket to produce 35,000 pounds or 156 kilonewtons of thrust. Now most small rocket engines usually work best with pressure fed systems. They don't need a pump at all. And this is often the best option for small hypergolic engines like the Draco reaction control system engines on the Dragon capsule, or even the larger Super Draco engines used for flight aboard. But as your tanks get bigger, it is extremely hard to keep them pressurized sufficiently so as to allow adequate fuel and oxidizer flow. Expander cycle engines, where fuel is running around the nozzle and heated with the expanded gas used to power a turbine, has only been used with hydrogen fuel in a small or medium sized engine like the Blue Origin BE-7 that would be used on the Blue Moon Lunar Lander if it ever gets to the moon. Dr. Marco Leonardi of the Sapienza University of Rome did an analysis and determined that methane would also be effective in an expander cycle engine to run a turbopump. The European Space Agency is planning to use methane in an expander cycle engine for use in their second stage vehicle called the Vega E. The engine will be called the M10 and you can see it here. This would be the world's first methane expander cycle rocket engine. The Starship uses heated oxygen to pressurize the oxygen tank and heated methane to pressurize the methane tank. But this is just to prevent vapor lock and is usually not more than two atmospheres for most rockets. Generating enough pressure to push the oxygen and methane out of large tanks would require up to a hundred atmospheres of pressure and the ability to repressurize a large volume very quickly and accurately. But you would need very thick tank walls making your rocket too heavy to fly efficiently. That is why turbo pumps are so important for large rockets. We covered the oxygen and methane turbo pumps in depth in the last lecture. The Raptor engines used an innovative fuel rich driven turbo pump for methane and an oxygen rich driven one for the liquid oxygen. This works great for methane, but I want to make clear that the dual turbo pump system on the Raptor would not work with RP-1. When RP-1 burns, it produces a lot of soot. This is called coking and would gum up any turbo pump that was burning RP-1 fuel rich. That is why the Soviets invented oxygen-rich turbopumps, by creating new alloys that could resist oxidation at high temperatures. Fuel-rich pumps have been used on the space shuttle main engines burning hydrogen, and of course, on the Raptor burning methane, because these fuels burn extremely clean and do not suffer from coking. But while pressure-fed engines work great for small rocket systems, and turbopumps are irreplaceably necessary for all large rocket systems, what if you wanted to make a medium-sized rocket? This is Peter Beck. Mr. Beck is an engineer from New Zealand and is the chief executive officer and chief technical officer of Rocket Lab. Rocket Lab is, like SpaceX, a very innovative company that is revolutionizing the space industry. Rocket Lab was founded in 2006 in Auckland, New Zealand, and funded by the entrepreneur who wins the greatest name in space ever award, Mark Rocket. Their success has led to a corporate headquarters in Long Beach, California in order to compete for American launch contracts. The first successful rocket for this company was a small sounding rocket called Atea. Atea was named for a Polynesian god and was a hybrid fueled single stage rocket. It carried a 2 kilogram dart like payload up to 145 kilometers into space. The Atea 1 was launched once on 30 November 2009 from Mercury Island in New Zealand climbing above the 100-kilometer Kármán line. 
A larger Atea II was initially planned, but Rocket Lab quickly realized they would need something larger to be commercially viable. They started working on a larger but still small rocket called the Electron, and were supported by a U.S. government contract to place small satellites into orbit for NASA. And the goal was to produce a small, relatively inexpensive rocket, capable of carrying up to 200 kilograms to low Earth orbit, and in this case, inexpensive means less than $10 million. To accomplish this, Rocket Lab had to be more innovative than its competitors. It decided that carbon fiber would be the perfect material from which to construct the rocket. The electron is small enough that the cost of carbon fiber is not too high, and light enough that the mass savings are worth it. To lift the electron rocket, they needed a small to medium-sized rocket engine. Rocket Lab decided to create the first fully 3D printed small rocket engine, and use a cluster of them. This saved a lot of money on machining and subcontracts. This engine is called the Rutherford engine, seen here. The Rutherford burns liquid oxygen and RP-1. Propellant tanks would be too large for a pressurized feed system, and they started looking at turbo pumps. Remember that turbo pumps have a small combustion chamber, usually called a preburner, where fuel and oxidizer are burned to power a turbine. The turbine is connected to a shaft that is connected to impellers. The impellers are separated by seals, so fuel and oxidizer don't mix. The spinning impellers pump the fuel and oxidizer into the combustion chamber to power the rocket. As we said, the turbo pump is one of the hardest things to create for a rocket. They are hard to get right and expensive to produce, often blowing up. Mr. Beck decided to think outside the box. Electric motors are incredibly efficient and controllable. Since their invention by Nikola Tesla over a century ago, they have been steadily improved. If Rocket Lab could replace the pre-burner and turbine part of a turbo pump, the most likely part to explode in a rocket, with an electric pump, it would solve a lot of problems. This had never been done before for a simple reason. You must provide electricity, and batteries have always been too heavy for this application. Let's look at why. First, what is a battery? Let's agree on a few definitions. A generator produces electrical power from outside energy. This energy can be mechanical if you spin a dynamo like a hand-cranked generator or a hydroelectric generator. They can also be powered by a gasoline or diesel motor that burns fossil fuels to turn a shaft that spins a generator and produces electricity. A solar panel is a type of generator, as it produces electrical power from light. A fuel cell is also a generator, as it uses a steady stream of hydrogen or hydrocarbon gas to produce power. Stop the gas flow and the power stops. A battery, on the other hand, does not produce electricity from a steady supply of fuel. A battery stores electrical charge and can be charged and discharged. It usually does this by using a reversible chemical reaction that produces electrons and ions. Car batteries are the oldest technology still in use. Car batteries are called lead-acid batteries. When you put electricity in them, an acid-mediated chemical reaction goes in one direction. When you draw electricity from them, the chemical reaction reverses and gives up the stored energy. The most advanced batteries in common use today are lithium-ion batteries. These power your smartphone, your laptop, and your car if you're lucky enough to have one of these. Lithium ion batteries have an energy density just high enough to make their use possible in this rocket application. There is a performance cost because the batteries are still heavy enough to be less efficient than the much lighter turbo pump system. But this cost in performance is made up in simplicity. It is much, much easier to build, test, and use an electric power pump. Now this is often called an electric turbo pump. But when you take out the turbine, this is no longer a turbo pump. It is an electric centrifugal pump. Only two rocket systems use this technology. Rocket Lab, using the Rutherford rocket engine, and Astra Space. Astra Space uses the Delphine rocket engine, seen here. Five of these power the first stage of the Astra rocket, seen here. In 2016, Astra was seen as the main competitor to Rocket Lab in the small launch market. But by 2017, Rocket Lab had raised an additional $75 million and launched the first Electron rocket May of that year. But this rocket failed to reach orbit due to a communications loss. In January of 2018, another Electron rocket was launched, and the Rutherford rocket engine became the first electric cycle system to reach orbit. Astra launched two suborbital test flights in 2018 from their Pacific Spaceport Complex in Alaska with rockets 1.0 and 2.0 that do not appear to have been completely successful. 
Astra had planned to launch the 3.0 in 2019, but this was delayed and then later destroyed by fire in March of 2020. Rocket 3.1 was launched later that same year, but the first stage failed and it fell back to Earth. In December 2020, Astra launched Rocket 3.2. The first stage worked fine and it passed the Kármán line into space. But due to issues with its upper stage fuel mixture, the second stage failed to reach orbit and burned up in the atmosphere. Rocket Lab has been doing much better. The Electron rocket reached orbit with its second launch and deployed three CubeSats. It has had 19 launches between 2018 and today, with only one other failure. On July 4th of 2020, the 13th launch of an Electron rocket failed when a bad electrical connector caused a loss of power to the electric pumps, with the consequent loss of thrust. The Electron rocket is 17 meters tall with a diameter of 1.2 meters. It has a total mass of 12,500 kilograms. The Electron rocket originally had two stages. The first stage is 12.1 meters long and powered by nine Rutherford engines burning RP-1 and liquid oxygen. The second stage is 2.4 meters long and powered by one Rutherford engine also burning RP-1. Rocket Lab has now added an additional kick stage using one small 3D printed Curie engine, running a viscous liquid monopropellant made of ammonium perchlorate, aluminum, and polydimethyl siloxane. The kick stage has the potential of being replaced with a true third stage called Photon. Photon is an innovative third stage using either a Curry engine for orbital operations or a Hyper Curry engine for interplanetary missions. It has composite structures to save mass, reaction wheels for attitude control, avionics for guidance, solar arrays for power, and star trackers for navigation. Photon Interplanetary can help small payloads reach the moon or even get up to 40 kilograms to Mars or Venus. The Electron rocket is amazing but it is much smaller, at 17 meters, than the Falcon 9 at 70 meters. Recognizing the need for a larger rocket system to compete with SpaceX, Rocket Lab has started development of this rocket. This will be the Neutron rocket. While the Electron can currently get 300 kilograms to low Earth orbit, the Neutron is much bigger and is planned to be able to get 8,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit, 2,000 kilograms to the Moon, and up to 1,500 kilograms to Mars or Venus. It is planned to be 40 meters tall, more than half the height of a Falcon 9, with two stages burning RP-1 and liquid oxygen. I'm not sure if Rocket Lab will be able to use electric cycle engines on the Neutron. The Electron is in the perfect size range to make the simplicity of electric cycle engines the best option, but larger rockets need a lot more power. The turbo pumps on each of the five F-1 engines lifting the Saturn V produced 55,000 horsepower or 205 megawatts for all five engines, in about 2.5 minutes. To provide this much electrical power would require about 71 tons of Tesla Megapack batteries, and they could not discharge that quickly. A large ship like the Falcon 9 uses turbo pumps burning RP-1 and liquid oxygen to produce at least 5,000 horsepower per turbo pump for each of its nine Merlin rocket engines, and would need at least 10 tons of Megapack batteries. Starship Raptor engines produce a lot of power. The mass of the batteries needed to power Starship engines would be just too high. Molten carbonate fuel cells can turn methane and oxygen into electricity and may be a great option for powering the Starship in orbit or on its way to the Moon or Mars, but cannot produce electricity fast enough to power the turbo pumps at launch. Electric cycle engines are optimal for small and medium-sized rockets, but not for really large ones. Battery technology must improve dramatically for it to be an option on large first-stage orbital rockets. It might still be a good option for second and third stages, though, if the mass of the batteries can come down. Batteries with much higher energy densities than lithium-ion, like aluminum air batteries, might be an option for spaceflight. Aluminum air batteries use a reaction between oxygen and aluminum to produce energy. They are not really batteries, as they cannot be charged and discharged, but are a type of generator. These have eight times the range of lithium-ion batteries with a much lower total mass. Another option is magnesium hydroxide. Magnesium hydroxide batteries are also not real batteries. You cannot just charge it back up with electricity. If a magnesium hydroxide paste is made under high pressure, it will then store a significant amount of hydrogen at normal temperature and pressure. This hydrogen can be released by adding some water. Its hydrogen storage ability is greater than a pressurized tank at 700 bars. 
This would also be a good option to provide hydrogen to your fuel cell, but cannot possibly produce power fast enough to run your large propellant pumps. What about supercapacitors? These are also called ultracapacitors. They can store 10 to 100 times more energy per volume or mass than electrolyte capacitors. They are great for rapid charge discharge systems like regenerative braking, but cannot hold enough power at this time to replace these turbo pump systems. What is the theoretical limit to power storage? It's hard to say. There is a limit to how many electrons or ions you can pack into one space before their electromagnetic repulsion and other factors interfere. But what about the Dr. Vox photonic box? Available in our dimension, but not known in yours. We discovered an alloy of rare earth elements that is the perfect photon mirror. It can perfectly reflect any photon from radio waves through visible light to gamma rays. We also invented a way to make it a one-way mirror. Photons can come in, but not go out. One side of the box can be electronically adjusted to a partial mirror allowing some of the photons to be released in a controlled fashion and used for power. How many photons can you pack in a small box? Theoretically, there is no limit, until you pack enough photons so that their combined mass creates a singularity. This would be a black hole made of light, or Kugelblitz, as Einstein named it. One ultraviolet photon has up to 100,000 electron volts of energy. This is only 1.6 times 10 to the negative 14 joules of energy per photon but an effective mass of one kilogram of ultraviolet photons would have 2.8 times 10 to the 14th megajoules. If you release this over one year, it would give you almost nine gigawatts of power continuously for that year. That would make ion propulsion, electric pumps, and even force fields possible. Something to think about, but you'll have to figure out how to contain the pressure generated by the photons bouncing off the walls. We just use titanium osmium alloy. Too bad you guys haven't made it up there to get some osmium yet. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And help us on Patreon if you can. We appreciate your support. At Astro Proterra.